Welcome to First United Methodist Church in Modesto. I am Pastor Deborah Brady, and we give thanks for your presence in our hybrid community as we worship on this fourth Sunday, the final Sunday in the season of Advent. One of our ritual traditions is to light an Advent candle, so online community, you might use this time to find a candle that you could light with us in just a couple of minutes. And we encourage all of you to greet one another in cyberspace and especially greet those who are joining us on one of our platforms. Visitors, guests, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you'll send us an email or fill out your registration card and let us know how we can come alongside you and support you in your own journey of faith. We will invite you to join in hymns and liturgy and stand and sit and feel free to participate or if it's just too much, it's fine to just observe and just stay seated and observe what's going on today. We do have an order of worship on our homepage of our website, online community, or you were given one by an usher as you came in today. Note that the order of worship is different today because our choir is bringing us a shepherd's carol cantata. So it's a good chance for us to practice being awake as our organist Arvin so beautifully played for us. And I trust in your adaptability to just pay attention uh, to the changes today. Last week, uh, as each of the Sundays, we had a mindfulness practice. And last week it was to uh, periodically with open eyes and ears open to notice God's presence in a way that br brings the fullness of joy. And a couple of you shared with me something going around on social media that called these moments glimmers. Glimmers, it says, if you want to decrease stress, start paying attention to your glimmers. Glimmers are the opposite of triggers. Glimmers are those tiny moments of joy, awe, and peace that cue our nervous system to feel safe, calm, and connected. Once you start looking for them, you will see them everywhere. So may this worship, this set-aside time, be full of glimmers for each of us of God's presence. Let us tune in with our body, our heart, and mind. Be present to ourselves, to God and one another as we worship. The faith narrative is careful to show us a lineage from King David to Jesus. It is no ordinary lineage. It is one that began in the shepherding of sheep, of leading and delivering the people in search of a home. Mary's womb becomes part of that lineage of love, offering the word world the gift of God's present in the flesh. As we enter the story of the birth of love among us, we are invited to be present with love. We may think the perfect gift is inside of, outreach to give, but in reality, we have all that we need the heart's love and presence. last Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. We open our hearts as we open the gift. The promise of love is the divine gift we receive. And what will we do with it? The gift of love is the essence of the birth of Christ, 
The Holy One wanted to be so present to us that God's Spirit became flesh in order to inhabit the gifts of touching, healing, comforting, and challenging. Love is the clarion call to us as Jesus' disciples. The more love we put into the world, the better the world will be. We light this candle of love as a sign that we will be present with love in the world. We invite you to stand in body or spirit and join with us as we sing together. Please join me in the unison prayer of presence. Holy living light of God, you are our loving presence. Let this love grow in our lives each day so we can be a presence of love to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. You may find it in the Red Hymnal, number 384. We will sing verses one through three. The lyrics will also be on the screen. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please greet each other with words and gestures of Christmas love. David didn't start out as a king. He started out as a caretaker of sheep. God's anointed ones, whether that is a king like David or Christ, which means anointed one, come time and again in our faith narrative 
from humble beginnings, from those who tend carefully to those in their care. Hear this excerpt from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. When David finally settled into the palace and Yahweh gave him rest from enemies on every side, he said to the prophet Nathan, here I am living in this house of cedar while the ark of God sits in a tent. Nathan replied to David, go, do whatever you have in mind for Yahweh is with you. That night, the word of Yahweh came to Nathan and said, Go and tell my servant David that this is what Yahweh wants. Are you the one to build me a temple? I have been without a temple from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling place. Whenever I traveled with the people of Israel, I did ever say to the governors when I, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a temple made out of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what Yahweh omnipotent says, I took you from the pastures and from following the sheep to be the ruler of the people of Israel. I have been with you wherever you went and destroyed all your enemies in your path. I give you fame like the fame of the great ones on the earth. I provide a palace for my people Israel. I will plant them where they will have a home of their own, a place where they will never be disturbed. Never again will the sinners oppress them as they did in the past, ever since the time I appointed judges to lead my people Israel. I will give you security from all your enemies. Furthermore, I alone will establish your house. This ends our first reading. The gift of God's present permeates the scriptures and finds its culmination in the presence of God among us, living and in the flesh. God's love is steadfast from generation to generation. We are the heirs of the kingdom, the family of God. No matter what happens in this world, we are not alone. Let us read responsibly the first four verses of Psalms 89. Forever I will sing the wonders of your love, Yahweh, proclaiming your faithfulness to all generations. I'll tell them that your love stands firm forever. Your fidelity is fixed in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen and sworn an, sworn an oath to David, my faithful one. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm throughout all generations. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Amen. Amen. Our proclamation continues as our musicians now bring us one part one of the cantata, The Shepherd's Christmas by Morton Luvas.
We pause to remember the backstory of the birth that drew the shepherds to Bethlehem. We recall that this child of love comes from the most humble of families, though we are sure to be informed by the gospel writer that Joseph was born from the lineage of David, shepherd king turned king. While David did not build a house for God in his time, Mary womb did become a house of the holy in hers. She accepts the role she is given to be present with love growing inside of her. We are reading the story of the Annunciation as recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. The story picks up six months after the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth learn that they will give birth to a son who we have come to know as John the Baptist. Listen now for God's word to us. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. Upon arriving, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one. God is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was deeply troubled by these words and wondered what the angel's greeting meant. The angel went on to say to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You'll conceive and bear a son and give him the name Jesus, deliverance. His dignity will be great and he will be called the Holy, only begotten of God. God will give Jesus the judgment seat of David, his ancestor, to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will never end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I've never been with a man? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence the offspring to be born will be called the Holy One of God. Know too that Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has conceived a child in her old age. She who is thought to be infertile is now in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary said, I am the servant of God. Let it be done to me as, to, as you say. With that, the angel left her. This ends our scripture reading through which the Spirit continues to teach the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Oh God, as we ponder your words in our hearts, we ask that you create space in us for love. To be nourished by it, to offer it back, to share with others as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Amen. For whatever reason, we often get things turned upside down when it comes to love. Too often, we fall for the idea that life is about earning love. And plenty of us, at one point or another, assumed that we would get love by achieving and accomplishing and accumulating. Some people spend their whole lives pursuing possessions or power or status, figuring <clears throat> that things like this would make us lovable. The problem is that we can become so obsessed with ourselves that we actually build walls between ourselves and other people. Our efforts then become self-defeating. And this same love-pursuing dynamic can take place in our spiritual lives as well. Plenty of people act as though our piety, the rigor of our moral conduct, or the orthodoxy of our theology 
will convince God to reward us, will convince God to love us. Paradoxically, this kind of re religiosity can form a kind of self-absorption that ends up isolating us from God and others. Last week, we talked about the spiritual practices of this season, our mindfulness practices, are not about self-improvement. These practices are meant to shape us in Christ-likeness. This week, I saw a quote by Bell Hooks on Aaron Littlepage's social media feed. Aaron is one of our church leaders here, and I often find sermon gems in her Facebook or Instagram posts, so watch out what you post. My Instagram. <laughs> So Bell Hooks uh, was an educator, an author, an activist, and this week marked the two-year anniversary of her untimely death at age 69. So I really appreciated being reminded of the profi profound insights she has about love. Bell Hooks said this, I am often struck by the dangerous narcissism fostered by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to individual self-improvement and so little to the practice of love within the context of community. God's gift of love invites us to start with giving up the self-defeating idea that any of us can get God to owe us one. That's just not how God operates. God's gifts are graciously given. And of course, on this fourth Sunday of the Advent season, we celebrate God's greatest gift of love as it was embodied, the divine presence in the person of Jesus. Jesus then invites us to embody love of God and neighbor. It is a love that moves us into community, in caring action. In our reading from 2 Samuel, God tells David through the prophet Nathan that he's never asked those who are called to shepherd the people of Israel to build him a house. God seems to like the idea that the divine presence is portable, on the move with the people, present wherever they go. And God reminds David of his own humble beginnings as a shepherd, and that the actions of a shepherd are the main thing that David should be doing, which is tending the sheep, tending the people. The word tend comes from the same root as the word attentive. Pay attention, notice the details, what is most needful, be present. In this way, love is conveyed. It is not the static view of power and status, but this dynamic and humble and alive attentiveness. The psalm reminds us of God's presence through the generations, the lineage of love through the house of David to tend to the covenant people that they might be channels of God's blessing to the whole world. God's love is steadfast. It's not just true in the past, but it's also true right here, right now. Love flows through the lineage to us. God's presence continues. The lineage is traced to Joseph, the spouse of Mary, whose very body becomes home to nurture and birth the Messiah. Mary accepts the invitations. She says yes to tend the holy and in this way live with God's presence, God's action of love within her to accomplish God's purposes. When the angel came to Mary, we don't really know what she was doing at the moment. Some Christian art depicts Mary very piously kneeling on her prayer bench with her prayer book. But I like this image of her just in ordinary life, perhaps just waking or about to go to sleep, just being present in her normal life when the angel arrives. 
We have been inviting all of us to use Amy Oden's book right here, right now as a, a devotional supplement in our season. And she writes in her book this, every day, every day, we seek to discern how to live faithfully. As we surf the internet and decide what gets our attention, as we choose news sources that will shape our worldview, as we buy groceries and steward our resources, we are always making choices about how we love the world that God so loves, about how our attention, our presence, participates in the mission of God, abundant life for all. Sometimes we think that if we could just be some other kind of person, then it would be possible for us to love the world. We can get obsessed about achieving and self-improvement, but the truth is if we can simply relax into who we are, we can find love accessible. Bell Hook offers this additional reflection about our own capacity to bear love in the world. She says, the light of love is always in us, no matter how cold the flame. It is always present, waiting for the spark to ignite, waiting for the heart to awaken. So our mindfulness practice this week is just to notice an opportunity in our ordinary life with our authentic selves to express love by tending, tending to some need, or just bringing our full attention to a person right in front of us. Doesn't have to be a grand gesture. In so doing, notice how that tending action, that shepherding action can awaken our heart to love. Now let us rejoin the story being sung by our choir as we arrive with the shepherds in Bethlehem to greet the child born to us as a lineage of love.
In the echo of this lovely lullaby, we come to our time of prayer. You know, there's a saying that love hurts. And indeed, when we open ourselves to the gift of love for others, we risk that chance that our compassionate hearts will break for the world that we live in. But the alternative, isolation and apathy, carries a great cost. We ourselves then become the lonely ones. We ourselves are left with an atrophy of heart rather than its awakeness and expansion. Being the gift of presence can complicate our lives, that's true. But it is the only way for us to thrive as human beings. So as we have been doing this season, we will begin our prayers with three questions followed by a short silence. I will say the question, it will be on the screen if that's helpful to you. This is something you can just imagine, and if it doesn't come quickly, don't freak out. Just use this time of silence uh, for awakeness and presence. So I invite you just to take a deep breath, relax, be present to your whole self. The first question is this. Who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a gift, a special connection? The second question, how did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did that feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? How did you offer yourself as a gift? The third question is this. What could you do in this coming week that would allow God's gift of love to flow through you to someone else? In this prayerful moment, O God, we bring our attention on those who are in distress. We pray for healing for our beloveds who are injured, who are ill, who are recovering from surgery, who are dealing with chronic disease. We pray for those who are weary and heavy laden, who feel decision fatigue from the challenges they face. May they all sense your healing, your presence with them shouldering the weight of life. We pray for those enslaved by addiction who are hanging on to sobriety by their fingernails. Let them know your freedom, their unconditional worth, the easing of anxiety and stress. We pray for those who are caregivers for chronically ill loved ones. Give them respite and wisdom and community. When we think of our world so easy to feel hopeless among the conflict, violence, and war that seem unending and unsolvable, help us to be people of hope and peace, joy, and love, to be present to your leading that we might see what is our part in joining you in the redeeming work you are always doing. In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention on thanksgiving and joy. We give thanks this week for music that makes our hearts open and expand for volunteers bringing joy and cheer around our community, for the spirit of generosity as those who have more than enough share with those who have little. We give thanks for beloved family members so precious to us. Especially we give 
thanks for Jennifer and Steve Ward's Aunt Georgie as she is celebrated through our altar flowers this day. In this prayerful present moment, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us savor our journey toward the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with things that do not last. Help us to stop, notice what we are experiencing, accept it with open hearts and minds. In doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, right now, right where we are. Amen. We continue in a prayerful reflection as we hear our offertory. We no longer pass offering plates during the service, and so we use this time to reflect on our discipleship and the next steps we might take in the coming week. For those who are inclined to invest in our ministry, we have an offering box out in the narthex just outside the doors, and all of the other ways you might contribute will be on the screen. I want to take just a moment to tell you about our Christmas offering. Those on our mailing list should have gotten uh, a letter this week. We have two recipients. Our offering will be divided in half, and last week we heard about the public school operated by uh, Sierra Vista Child and Family Services. Half of our offering will go for them, and half of our offering will be given to the United Methodist Committee on Relief. So in addition to our community, we always want to reach out globally. And so we have a short video about UMCOR and their work. Every day, in places all around the world, disaster strikes, families struggle, homes and livelihoods are destroyed. People don't know where to turn. Hope is almost lost. And then, by the grace of God and through the support of people like you, UMCOR provides hope and healing to communities devastated by disasters. Part of the General Board of Global Ministries, UMCOR is a humanitarian relief arm of the United Methodist Church. Working in the U.S. and in countries around the world, UMCOR offers help when natural or man-made disasters overwhelm a local community's ability to respond and seeks to improve the well-being of displaced peoples, migrants, and refugees. In the U.S., UMCOR partners with United Methodist Annual Conferences, working with disaster response coordinators, disaster response ministries, and early response teams to provide support for relief and recovery efforts. By working together with U.S. conferences, UMCOR's connectional approach helps communities recover faster and makes survivors' lives whole again. UMCOR also responds to international disasters, providing a range of relief and recovery support through local Methodist churches and trusted partners, as well as ecumenical and non-governmental organizations. UMCOR's efforts to help communities become more self-sufficient and better prepared for future disasters include care for the environment and sustainable agriculture. Every day around the world, UMCOR connects United Methodist churches to God's mission by helping people who are suffering. As followers of Christ, we are called to protect the vulnerable, support the weak, and comfort those who mourn. To learn more or to give to UMCOR, visit UMCOR.org. So this second half of our offering will be going to UMCOR's project to support the war victims in Gaza and Israel. So they work with partners there to offer food and medical supplies, medical care, trauma care, relocation support, all the things that they can do to support the people who are in danger and um, victims of the war there. So pray about that and we hope that you will give generously in these ways of caring, showing our caring love to our neighbors. In addition, please note all of the things coming up uh, that we've described in our Friday announcements that come by email. Some of those are also available in the insert in our worship materials. Uh, two things today, if you want to order poinsettias for Christmas Eve, we need your order form today. 
and also our United Women in Faith are having their annual Christmas cookie sale in the fireside room right after worship, so we'll, we hope you'll join them there. Please note our Christmas Eve services next Sunday, 10 o'clock in the morning at our usual time, and then also 8 p.m. Uh, for candlelight communion service. Let us continue our worship as we hear the offertory. Thank you, Lisa. Now let, our, let us join our voices in a doxology of praise as we sing the carol, The First Noel. You can find it in the red hymnal number 245. We are singing stanzas one through four, and the lyrics will also be on the screen. As you are able, I invite you to stand as we sing together.
let us continue in an attitude of prayer. O oh, Holy One, this Advent season we wait in love and we give in love. We admit that there are times when we feel the darkness is just too prevalent, too strong, and love is just wishful thinking. May we witness through our giving not scarcity and despair, but extravagant love and compassion. May we also witness through what we say and what we do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated as our musicians conclude the Shepherd's Christmas. Musicians. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the benediction. Go now and be truly present, so that you may be a gift of presence for others. That's all that is expected, that the gift that is you is the best gift you can give. In the name of the Holy Presence, the divine gift and the spirit of love that is just waiting for us to unwrap abundant life. Amen. Amen.